Oh, thank you for taking an hour and talking to me, my friends. No, thank you for inviting me. This is my first podcast, so I'm very excited. Oh my excited. gosh! <laughs> well, welcome, welcome. Yeah, we're gonna we'll try to keep it light and exciting for you, but. I know that um, the things that you're going to share are going to be really interesting and exciting for people because the door works in AI, everybody. <laughs> it's a hot topic of conversation. So, but first, before we get into all the artificial intelligence, and I'm sure we're going to talk good and evil because there's a few things I just, you know, there's some arguments that are really coming up. So many people are coming out with, with um, different perspectives on the future of the world in an AI enhanced reality. So I'm looking forward to, to talking about some of those perspectives and then what it what you're seeing in the work that you're doing. But first, if we just zoom out to education for a second and contextualize that we're talking about teaching and learning here. Um, and when we talk about AI, we won't talk about it in all facets of the world and how it's gonna, it could be used all over the place, but we can focus on education as well. But you did not go to school in Canada, if I'm correct. You. Um, were part of an education system as a child. Could you tell us more about your experience with education? Because I feel, I like to start this way with everybody because we work in a field that we've been in pretty much our whole lives in one way or another, yeah. right? Yeah. So what were your first experiences with teaching and learning? Did you like school? Did you not like school? What was school like where you were growing up? So I've I've been fortunate enough to I think be part of three different uh, uh, educational systems, right? So I grew up in India, uh, where education was we had little to no technology in the classroom, right? So a traditional form of learning, um, textbooks, uh, memorize everything, um, not a lot of flexibility in terms of um, you. You didn't have the freedom to think creatively. Um, you know, if you answered something that didn't exist in a textbook or wasn't part of what was taught in the classroom. You were penalized. Um, and there wasn't a lot of focus on problem solving. It was just learn what we teach you and then spit that out when we ask you to, right? Um, and I think it was during my time at university when I was doing my bachelor's degree in engineering, I that's when the MOOCs came out and platforms like EDX, uh, edX and Coursera came out. And I, I realized there was a lot of different ways to learn. Um, if you, if you could adapt quickly. Um, and, um, yeah, then, then I moved to Australia where it was completely, you know, my, my masters, when I was studying my masters, it was so different because the focus was all on research. Um, the what they taught you in the classroom was just a small part of, of your learning experience. They you were required to go out there and seek answers on your own um, using whatever uh, technology. You, like you could go to the library, you can go online. You you had access to so much, which I didn't back home in India. Um, and then now I'm here in Canada, uh, and uh, today. You know, AI and all the things, all the cool things that we are doing in our classrooms here, uh, this just changing um, what the learning experience, even the experience for, you know, faculty and staff, like the, delivering these courses, it's all changed so, so much. Um, it's amazing. I, I feel like, you know, I've gone from like the floppy disk time all the way to... <laughs> Uh, where we are today so it's uh, it's exciting it's very exciting and I, I would say in in growing up uh, I don't think the the teachers or like the universities in India paid a lot of attention to different learning methodologies like they didn't focus on how, how a student likes to learn it was more like this is the way you have to learn, even if you don't like it. You know, it was like, there are some some courses I had an aptitude for, some I didn't. Um, so there was a lot of feeling like, you know, asking a fish to climb a tree, right? You know, like, mm. you know, I, I feel like there were some subjects I would have probably fallen in love with if they were just taught to me a little more differently. Um, but right. this is an interesting, so we're talking culture, right? Because school yeah. systems are a reflection of the culture that surrounds them. 
So growing up in India, having, and my father's also, you know, when having South Asian background um, in the North of India, you know, the school system regurgitation transmission oriented, right? Knowledge comes from me. I put it into you and then you spit it back out at me. It's that transmission way of thinking about teaching and learning, but culturally it was normal. Like this, you know, you, you went to school in that environment. And like you said, you didn't even realize that there was something that was missing. Yeah. <laughs> you, you were, then you went to the university system. And so in higher education, even within India, the cultural expectation of higher education was that you had to think a little bit more. You had to have a bit more autonomy, but it wasn't until moving into another cultural system of Australia where really you were pushed out of the classroom and knowledge and skill acquisition was seen as not necessarily just being in the heads of an expert, but being something you cultivate over time through experience. So it's yeah. fascinating the cultural side of things because what is interesting to me about the technological arms race, as it were, is we need to have critical conversations about the kind of culture we want to be supporting, right? Because yeah. I worry a little bit in North America, we live in a capitalist culture, right? So here we are very much in, and in North America, we are in a highly competitive, um, I would say very individualistic, success oriented, uh, money being a big determinant of that definition of success oriented. And if we're not careful, technology would be used to separate us further, to make rich people wealthier, to increase those gaps that are already incredibly wide already because of the way our culture is already set up. So yeah. how do you see that interplay between, technologies are cool. All these things are coming out, like me and you, a similar generation, no technology, no cell phones, no anything, first desktop in the house, floppy disks, pagers, right? Pagers yeah. were so exciting. <laughs> To now, but where does your brain go when you're considering like, okay, but we have to be careful because we're humans and humans are cultural beings and we're going to think we're making decisions that are really smart, but ultimately we're making decisions that are in line with cultural normative beliefs. Yeah, yeah. So uh, when I think about how um, culture has played a part in, in terms of my learning, I, I think of what it did to my mindset and your core beliefs, right? Like if you are asking somebody to learn something in a way, uh, like for example, you know, we, some of us are visual learners, some of us, you know, like to read, some of us like to do things and learn. So if you're taught something in a way that is not good for you, uh, then I think you can grow up with a belief that you're just not good at anything, right? Mm -hmm. And and I think technology kind of bridges that gap. Um, if you are encouraged to use technology, go out there and seek your answers the way you want to uh, learn, then you get into this practice of lifelong learning uh, and this growth mindset that, um, you know, technology can change quickly, but I can also learn just as fast. You know, I can... Um, I can adapt, uh, I can upskill, I can reskill. Um, I don't have to worry about the world changing. Um, so I think that's something that happened to me in Australia and here. Um, yeah, the mindset piece is critical because I feel like if we just, like if somebody gave me a hammer, but didn't tell me what I could use it for, or didn't show me or talk to me about building a house and the importance of, hammers and nails but hammers in in a combination of with a screwdriver and a saw and a you know like a tool kit right yeah. it, 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 the stories we tell about why technology is here what it is helpful for why we're bringing it into specifically here this context of education right because yeah. you i feel like it's safe to say because i do know you slightly i do know you a bit um you were a responsible person. You were going to university. You wanted to learn. You already had a certain level of intrinsic motivation to learn. Then these technological tools were introduced to you when you went into the school system in Australia and you quote unquote, use them for good, not evil, right? 
Yeah. But yeah. I think what everybody is concerned about now is if we don't offer context and actually yeah. say to people, we need to develop a mindset in students and faculty members in order yeah. to make use of these technologies effectively. And effectively, I mean, listen, I understand that people will say what's effective, but in a way that I'm just gonna say good versus evil, okay? Like in a way that like brings us together as opposed to bringing us apart, as a way that helps us collaborate as opposed to solely being competitive. Like yeah. we need both, right? Where are you feeling, because you do a lot of work specifically um, talking to tech companies, like and working with different software providers, IBM, Microsoft, just to name a few. Where where are their conversations? How do you feel they're thinking about that complementary mindset piece? That it cannot just be about here's the new tool, but it has to also include the why, the how, and that support piece. Yeah, so those conversations, I think, have changed over the last four or five years or even, you know, long before that. Um, I think in the in the previous decade, uh, I think AI was restricted to the realm of science fiction, you know, if you will. Uh, and it was something that people looked at with curiosity and excitement rather than judgment because it didn't really impact their lives. It was... It was something like Jarvis from Iron Man. Like you said, oh, that's that's really cool, but I don't have to worry about it. Um, but today, because it is such a big... Actually, it's been a part of our life for longer than we think, uh, right? AI and machine learning is part of everything long before chat GPT ever, um, uh, you know, uh, became a part of our life. Like we, we have recommendation systems um, on Netflix and Amazon that you know, uh, recommend products and movies for you that that really helps you out. Like you don't have to do that work on your own. Um, there's, you know, email, Gmail auto completes email for you because, uh, you know, it generates text. That's the same generative models that GPT kind of built, uh, built itself on. So it's been helping us for a long time, but we didn't worry about it. Uh, but today, I think AI has, uh, I, I think threat is not the right word, but it does have the potential to radically change how you live your life and how you do your job and uh, and how you think, um, right? So all these big companies that we talk to, um, their focus is on making making these tools accountable, making them transparent, um, so the user has control over what you train your AI on, uh, that you completely understand what it can and cannot do. Um, so you don't have to worry that it's going to take over the world. Um, and their, I think their primary focus is also on making it a, a um, what is the word, um, augmented AI, right? It, it should be something that supports you, not something that does your job. Um like Microsoft's Copilot, which is named very aptly, uh, it's it's meant to be a copilot. You know, you'll always be the pilot of anything that you're trying to do digitally. But like I always tell people, AI will now get you to start thinking where your thinking previously stopped. Mm. Right. So so you don't have to worry about. Um, Things like where do I where do I go and do my research? What how should I type out an email? Um, what you know what are the places I should visit? Like you, you don't have to do all those mundane things that all the headspace that you used for things that uh, you know AI can now do. You can start thinking of bigger ideas and more uh, uh, more space for critical thinking. So and creative because this is yeah. You know, this is something that somebody, so I'd love to get your perspective on this because, you know, a lot of people feel as though this idea of generative AI or, or, or singularity and I, I I personally, just to disclaim my opinion, uh, and I am not uh, technically, as you know, <laughs> I'm not a technically savvy person, 
But understanding neurobiology in the fields that I study as a social cognitive scientist, we don't fully understand the brain. Exactly. We don't even understand how the brain works fully, okay? Yeah. It's like yeah. in the universe, we, we've we mapped like 3% of the freaking universe, right? There's a lot of stars and, and galaxies out there that yeah. we don't understand. So yes, artificial or computing neural networks and this idea, I think sometimes the language is hard for people. Like it makes it feel like the, like it's way smarter than it is. Neural networks are this idea of deep learning, right? That they talk about with, with computing. How far away do you think it is? Because I agree, there's this idea of separating between AI, there are tasks and there is definitely a threat. And I know that, you know, there is definitely spaces where automation will take away jobs, certain jobs that yeah. people have. It's a fact, it's true. The printing press, like, you know, the, 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 um, the industrial manufacturing lines, like there are a lot of things like robotics has already taken a lot of manual labor jobs. So this again, to your point is not new. It's It's been an evolving practice of the workforce and the economic makeup of what human beings do in the economic yeah. realm. It's been, it's evolved ever since, you know, we, we became agriculturalists and then all of a sudden we were mer merchants. And so these are things have evolved over time, but the threat of AI being emotive, cognitive in the sense of being creative in the way that a human being can, because you can go to ChatGPT Vidor and say, write me a poem about love and it'll do it. Yeah. Yeah. But in my definition, that's not the way it's writing it and it's calling upon the things that uh, exist in the world. Yeah. It's not creative or emotive or emotional or, or human in its yeah. output. But there is this idea of fearing the sentient, this the the feeling, the emotive, the human-like AI. What wh where do you think we are in that process, or is that a a real threat that we should be considering? I I don't think so. I, I think we are we are far away. I don't I, I don't even think that's the goal um, because so with with AI, the way I think about any AI software is like a human being in the sense that it starts off as a baby, just like we all do, right? It can only answer questions about things that it knows about. So you you have the opportunity to teach it, to control uh, what, you know, what you train it to do in terms of automating tasks, uh, but it still cannot do what a human being can do. Um, and, and a good example of this is uh, what we were trying to do as part of the perpetual course model uh, is try and predict student performance based on their, um, you know, their grades, their uh, their activity on uh, on our learning management system. And we also did a, a little proof of concept with uh, with OIPA, which is you know York's institutional planning and analysis team, and they they brought in. Uh, four, 440 different variables to try and predict student performance. So we built this ma machine learning model that looks at, you know, their financial status, their high school grades, um, you know, their engagement on E-class, how long, uh, how long they spent in their course and like a lot of stuff, right? But it still could not predict accurately if a student was going to fail or pass because there are a lot of things that you can't digitally quantify or put into a system, right? Like, for example, a student might have gotten COVID just before his exam. We don't know that. Um, or a family member probably, you know, passed away or is sick. Like, th there are things that mm -hmm. an AI will nev never know. Uh, it, it Empathy is, is one thing I don't think you can program into any system. Um, I don't think you can program that into a lot of human beings as well, to be honest. <laughs> But there's, I think that's that'll always be that'll always be lacking, um, and yeah. So like, it won't, it'll never know uh, things the way a human being does. And and the whole, I think, the goal of building an artificially intelligent system is, like you said, we're trying to mimic the human brain, and even we don't completely understand how the human brain brain works because it's so complex and it's it's continuously evolving, um, right? So, 
Yeah, and, and even the the computing power that it would take to go from where we are right now with GPT to some to singularity or create an AI that is uh, sentient is is massive. Uh, you know, and even if um, one of these big companies they have the resources to do something like that, like a quantum computer, it won't be accessible and definitely not sustainable um, to roll that out uh, across the world. So but it's interesting what you say about, but that's not the purpose, right? Because this yeah. is where, again, we get to the culture side of things. And this might be me being a bit more of a conspiracy theorist, but this capital, you know, like there are people in the world that want to live forever and they have billions yeah. of dollars. And so they invest like billions of dollars in trying to live forever. And they come yeah. up or like, you know, Elon Musk in the moon and trying to, you know, like people who have a lot of money, the doors sometimes yeah. do really <laughs> weird things. Yeah. Okay. When you live in a capitalist society, you know, the individual, I have money, which means I have power, which means I have influence, which means I'm going to do what I want. I, I'll do, you know, Bill Gates, they, you know, these people do certain things, some, you know, some of the things that they're doing in terms of like, fine, malaria. Okay. But you know, Bill Gates also owns, like has bought the majority of the ar arable farmland in the world. Like these things are frightening what people can do. And so I yeah. don't have the faith necessarily that you might have. <laughs> I don't necessarily trust yeah. that greed and power will not contribute to an overwhelming dedication of resources for a purpose that is evil, not good. Like maybe yeah. just doing it because they want to do it, Vidor, because they want to be the first ones who can do it, right? Because it's kind of like this, this moonshot, this unreachable thing, right? Like yeah. living forever. Yeah. So... But the but the but the more um, relevant question now is you talked about training, and we talked about accountability. So from what I understand about artificial intelligence, it's only as intelligent as the training it goes through. Like you said, right? Like a baby. Like what do you feed it? What does it consume? Also, who is involved? Which humans are involved yeah. in selecting that material for you to consume? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's that same way that there's privilege privileged information in the world, right? We live in a colonized, a re realization of a colonized world. If you think of the textbooks that existed in India when you went to school, there was a lot of Eurocentric co colonial um, talk in a lot of the things, the materials that exist in the world. So what do you think we need to do? Because one of the things that's being recommended is, is policy recommendations and oversight, right? So what would be your recommendations in terms of making sure or safeguarding against biases whether they yeah. be racial, ethnic, cult, you know, cultural, like AI machines are only going to be as intelligent. They're going to have a kind of intelligence based on the intelligence we have in our in our cultures, but our intelligence is flawed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and I I completely agree. I, I think that that's that's another piece to these conversations we're having with all these big companies is um, is bias. Uh, you you can never get rid of bias uh, because we cannot as human beings uh, you can never rid yourself of bias so the only solution to that i can think of is uh, diversity in development right you need to have a good representation of the population in the room when you're selecting your training data um, and not just selecting your training data you have everyone has to be involved um as you as you are building your models and and your you know uh making your ai more sophisticated um and i'm i'm not just talking about bias in terms of racial ethnic or gender bias i'm even talking about um make ai should be it's now cross disciplinary like if something we build at the university should have people involved from every area of york right you need people from finance because every question that a user would ask an ai has so many it's so multifaceted like there are so many elements to it like if a student goes in there and says i'm struggling with my course i need help it could be anything right it could be financial problems it could be mental health it could be academic it so you need not just people from different backgrounds, but you need people with 
different areas of expertise in the room looking at the data from all different angles and saying okay this is where there could be some bias and this is where you know this is the language we should not uh, put into the system so i think diversity i think that's that's the answer to a lot of our problems today but yeah yeah definitely. exactly because that's it, this is fascinating because if i think to myself how i try as an individual to mitigate bias in news for example right because yeah. news outlets are companies that have points yeah. of view that have investors so except cbc except a national broadcaster but even then your national broadcaster is is the political arm of of your country so it's diversity so i yeah. i consume news from a variety of sources in an effort to try to figure yeah. out what's the middle <laughs> yeah. between all yeah. these different sources of information this is a really fascinating conversation. We're going to keep it going. Uh, we're going to split it so that, you know, this is part one, Vidur. We're going to pick it back up. Part two, join us, click That's the button <laughs> uh, and join us for this continued conversation. That's just part one of this exciting conversation, my friends. Click on part two and continue with us on this important journey we like to call the education revolution.